So I'm Russell Wills, I'm a paediatrician in Hawke's Bay and I've been Children's Commissioner since the 1st of July. And it's my pleasure to, to give this opening keynote and um, on behalf of the Office of the Children's Commissioner, know my heart and my whakatau mai. <coughs> I'm absolutely delighted to be co-presenting this uh, opening presentation with uh, four members of the Young People's Reference Group. Um, and um, uh, with me today will be Prashan uh, Kasinda, Jessica Pellaray, Alex uh, Crotch, and Kieran Denton. Um, and Prashan's going to help with the uh, introduction as well. Kia ora tato. Good morning, everyone. First of all, we would like to thank Alcohol Action New Zealand and its supporters for making this conference happen as well as other contributors today for lending their voice to this topic and advocating for children and young people. We would also like to thank Dr. Wills for the chance he has given us to speak today so that as this issue affecting children and young people is discussed, children and young people can share their views. And finally, we thank you for attending and wanting to make a difference in the way alcohol affects babies and children in New Zealand. So as I said, I'm a paediatrician and my experience in using a child rights uh, approach uh, is really uh, largely at a local level. I'm still getting the hang of what it means to do this at a national level. Um, so for this talk, my colleagues and I are going to discuss the broader context of alcohol-related harm to children and young people, uh, their views on the issue, and we're going to focus on local solutions to alcohol-related harm to children and young people using a rights-based approach. So this is Mandy. She's 17 and she's estranged from her abusive parents since she left home at 15. Now this is based on a real case with some details changed. She's on the independent youth benefit. She drinks heavily and she uses drugs when she can. She's transient and she's pregnant. She's just been arrested for willful damage after breaking a window while drunk most likely as part of a cry for help. So what's the likely outcome for Mandy and her baby in 2012? How did this happen? And what can we do to improve this? So as a clinician specialising in severe behaviour, I'm seeing children with fetal alcohol effects increasingly in my practice, and it worries me enormously. These children do remarkably badly. Uh, they manifest much like children with ADHD, but their learning difficulties are often more severe. Um, the dose of stimulants they need to gain any semblance of control is often considerably higher, and of course they have the side effects of that. We're also seeing increasing numbers of uh, what are initially presented as sudden unexplained death in infancy, which um, we're recategorising really as overlying. And alcohol clearly has an important part to play in that. And Nick Baker, who's talking after us, will be talking about that, I'm sure. Paediatricians also see abuse and neglect of children and young people. Um, and commonly we see the behavioural and developmental consequences of parents who have alcohol and other drug addictions as well as uh, mental illness. There's no doubt that alcohol affects parenting capacity <coughs> and it means that they aren't able to respond to the emotional and developmental needs of children and that has profound consequences, particularly as we're learning more about attachment disorder and trauma is that manifests as behavioural problems that are increasingly presenting to us in child and adolescent mental health and in paediatrics. <coughs> so of course there's direct harm for the drinker, we're aware uh, of that, mostly for adults and young people, uh, that's around injury, but it clearly makes mental illness worse as well. So 
So what is the cost of alcohol to society? Other speakers are going to talk about this later today. Why is it that we allow new alcohol outlets to set up in poor suburbs that already have two or three or four of them? Why is that? While there wasn't much for us in alcohol law reform, one thing there is is an increased ability for local government to decline uh, new applications uh, for alcohol outlets um, and to respond to, to public feelings about that. And thank goodness for that. At last, a piece of sense in local government legislation that's going to help the local democratic process. The figures we have from Caswell suggest that alcohol um, as a burden of disease contributes to around 1% of gross domestic product. I'm sure that's an underestimate. Um, the, um, Connor and Caswell have talked about a burden of around five or six hundred million dollars in terms of alcohol-related harm a year in New Zealand. That's going to be closer to the truth, but again, as you'll know, estimating the cost of harm is hard. And it's likely to be an underestimate. So when we're considering policy options and anything, we need to consider the broader context. And there are other detrimental effects on families. And these issues are not rare. For those of us in clinical practice, we see these things often daily. And as you all know, they often congregate in families. So it's common to see all of these issues <coughs> here in one family. And each of them needs to be identified, assessed well, and included in a comprehensive management plan. If we're talking about policy change, we also need to be clear about the influences on governments. Governments don't work in a greenfields playing situation. The world financial crisis is real. It's affecting us right now. District health boards and services like mine are having to pull out real dollars from services right now, and that will affect FTEs. So if we ask government to spend money on a thing, it has to come from somewhere, and we need to be clear about where that's going to come from. We have an increasingly informed public and media that creates demands on politicians, and it creates demands on health services. We've got rising acute demand, particularly from the increasing elderly population, and the costs of care are going up. <coughs> Remarkably for me, we have widespread tolerance of all of these issues, which means that attitudinal change has got to be part of the solution. We have public resistance to intrusion in private lives, and witness the pushback from the um, Section 59 uh, hitting children law reforms. Uh, and I'm sure that contributed to, to the previous government's uh, loss of power. So that is very real, and governments had to take that into account. And then finally, as we'll see shortly, the alcohol industry is very powerful and very clever at pushing back at us. So this picture you see here is schoolboy rugby. So you get a sense of how early the influence of the alcohol industry has an influence on children and young people. All of these issues are relevant to the effects of alcohol on children and young people. The marketing is very sophisticated. We have absurdly cheap alcohol an absurdly easily available alcohol in New Zealand. <coughs> Drink driving countermeasures are limited by the amount of resource we can put into them. And as adults, we're role modelling drinking behaviours for the next generation. And sometimes, my peers are not modelling the kinds of behaviours that we would expect from young people, and yet we blame them. So the alcohol industry, it's really clear, um, is using similar tactics to that used by the cigarette 
industry to promote um, alcohol and to undermine the health promotion tactics that we use. So we're going to have to be very clever to have an effective response to that public health respect, to that health, public health risk. So as Dr. Wills mentioned, we are part of the YPRG, the Young People's Reference Group. And as the YPRG, as well as advising Dr. Wills, we advocate for the rights of children and young people in New Zealand in different ways. I was actually lucky enough to attend this uh, conference last year and learned a great deal, and it is with pleasure that I'm able to return today. Jess and Alex will be discussing alcohol in relation to the media and violence, and Karen will be offering some recommendations. But first, I would like to direct you to the quote that is on the screen. What's never focused on is the fact that children and young people are the victims. This is a quote from a young person which we received from a survey we sent out earlier this year. There's a term called the second-hand effects of alcohol, which relates to what others suffer as a consequence of those abusing alcohol. Others, in this case, being children and young people. Alcohol can take away a child's right to safety, a clean environment, food and water, protection from things that can harm them, and ultimately life. And it is the second-hand effects of alcohol on babies, children, and young people that should be the focus when making decisions about how to improve New Zealand's drinking culture. And the second issue that really stems from the drinking culture is our teen drinking culture. And I say teen loosely because the normal age to start drinking is getting lower and lower. There's a simple response to that. Unless New Zealand's drinking culture as a whole is targeted first, including how much power the alcohol industry has over individuals, our teen drinking culture is not going to change. Young people's role models are adults. The people who are supposed to be responsible for young people who freely let them go off and get drunk are adults. The people who are often the suppliers of the alcohol are adults. So therefore, we cannot expect to target teen drinking first and expect to make a difference. The fact is, Children and young people have no political power. We need adults to fight and advocate for us. I'll now pass over to Jess. When thinking about what the most important message that I could give to all of you today could be, I really thought the idea of expectations that we get from the media was the most important one. Because it's no news that we have this drinking culture, as Prashan has just talked about. But what does need to be news is that this is all not just young people's fault. But in fact, it's the fault of the media for sensationalising alcohol and getting drunk. Because what the adults will say is that us teenagers, we can't drink responsibly. When in fact, the expectation that's put on us by the media, and that's become the social norm, is that as teenagers, we should not drink responsibly. Growing up in the 21st century means that we are constantly exposed to the media which um, controls the way in which we look at things. And we, we have got, we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, we've got music videos and the messages that we get from our music, we've got celebrities who are meant to be our role models, and we've got TV shows and movies. And the list of where we get our influences from in the 21st century just goes on and on and on. And the messages that we get from all of these things is that as a 16 year old girl in New Zealand, I should be rebellious against my parents. I should be getting drunk. I should be taking drugs. It's normalizing all of these things that I've been told about, but at the same time, I'm being told that in fact, they're just normal. And as a New Zealand teenager, I should be doing all of these things. Because then I look at that, I listen to my music, I see ads on TV, watch TV shows and think, what does that make me if I'm not what I'm meant to be? Does it make me abnormal? Does it mean that I need to conform to peer pressure to be normal? Does it mean that I'm not a real New Zealand teenager? And I think that that there 
is a key problem with this whole alcohol problem and the effect that it has on other young people. Because it's teaching us to conform to this really bad New Zealand drinking culture. Because apparently, this is what it's, you know, being a teenager is all about. Getting drunk. It's what we meant to do to have a good time. I mean, the media targets us young people. They put millions of dollars each year into advertising. That means that us young people are told that, yeah, we're meant to get drunk. So if you want to stop the drinking culture in New Zealand, I really believe that you have to stop the media giving this really bad image to young kids in New Zealand. I mean, it means that young kids won't grow up with this expectation, like me and my friends have been, that in order to have a good time, you need to get drunk. A major way in which alcohol causes harm to young people is violence fueled by drunken behaviour. In many situations of physical abuse, alcohol consumption makes the problem much worse. Violent people are more aggressive when intoxicated. People can often become aggressive and abusive when drunk, especially those that are violent normally. As well as this, intoxicated young people may be more likely to be the victims of violence because they show more risk-taking behaviour. Physical abuse in families is usually directed towards children. A statistic from the New Zealand Police shows alcohol is a factor of around 29% of family violence issues in the instance they have investigated. When violent parents are drunk, it just makes things worse. The abuse and its consequences just get much more serious. A quote from my group's recent survey on the second-hand effects of alcohol stated that in families with physical violence issues, alcohol escalates the problem badly. Violence between young people is more prevalent when alcohol is involved. There is a strong link between high alcohol use and violence between young people. 14% of young people in a Youth 2000 survey said they had been in a fight whilst drunk. It isn't hard to see that alcohol can fuel aggressive behaviour, especially in young people. Children will feel unsafe and scared in their homes and communities if alcohol fueled violence is present. Young people are shaped by the communities and families that they grow up in, so it is important that they feel safe and secure in these environments. Often when alcohol is being abused, there are people being hurt, and those people are all too often children. Yet, what's never focused on is the fact that young people are the victims. As a group, we saw the green paper on vulnerable children as a great opportunity to make government aware of the negative consequences for children and young people growing up around alcohol and bringing their struggles to the forefront of the decision making. The YPRG surveyed young people from around New Zealand. Their answers were relevant, high-level pieces of information. As a conference, we need to set a precedent. Children and young people want and need to be engaged in the decision making process and their views be taken into consideration. Children have no political power. They rely on adults both in and out of government to approach, consider, discuss our views and opinions, which allows us to be positive change makers and active contributors to policy. As we mentioned in our Green Paper submission, um, these steps will help the, to improve the situation for children and young people in New Zealand. Remove alcohol advertising from, from spons alcohol advertising and sponsorship from sports and other cultural activities. The secondhand effects of alcohol need to be openly condemned by government. Um, an awareness campaign funded by government and uh, facilitated by government organisations. You can read our submission at occ.org.nz. This is not my issue, it's not your issue, it's our issue. Every single person in New Zealand needs to make a sacrifice which allows for culture change. 
Government needs to place public well-being above and beyond the profit from the liquor industry. There is no silver bullet. There is no one person who can change culture. But together, everyone can make their sacrifice so children and young people are not the victims. So where does the convention come in on this? Those of you who know the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child would know that it's a comprehensive statement of how the world should be for children and young people. And we ratified the 54 articles of the UN Convention um, some 20 years ago now. So the Convention requires us as a country to do some things. And you can read those for you now, for, you, for yourselves up there. When I'm teaching on the Convention, what I invite people often to do is to hold that slide in their head when you're thinking about what you just heard from the young people in the YPRG. And ask yourselves to what degree does alcohol proscribe these rights that we signed up to 20 years ago. But the convention is also a useful way of thinking about how we implement policies and programs at a local level as they affect children and young people. So when I'm beginning a project, uh, for example, on the Before School Check um, or uh, a violence intervention program, I find it helpful to start by having an explicit discussion about and agreeing our values, the values that underlie that project or that program and writing them down. This becomes very helpful when difficult decisions come up later, as they often do, and become a benchmark to test our values again. And I like to ask people, what will we actually do that demonstrates these values? So when we say that all children have these rights, what does that mean? In the Before School Check program, we are very clear that we will do everything we can. We'll move heaven and earth to see every child who's entitled to that program. We use a database to know whether children are due, whether they receive their cheque, to find them if they're missed and to follow them up. In a local alcohol program, this could mean active case finding of pregnant women who are drinking and not giving up when they say that they don't want to. What does discrimination mean? It means we're focused particularly on outcome equities. So Māori and Pacific access rates to before school checks, well child immunisations are actively monitored and everything is done that's possible to lift those access rates up. For alcohol related harm, it could mean monitoring access rates for alcohol treatment services and which schools and communities we have programs in and how effective they are. Paramountcy means we prioritise children and young people for prevention and treatment services. If my drinking got out of hand and I needed help, and a young person needed help at the same time, they should be prioritised first. Survival and development means we ensure our acute services are properly equipped and staffed, and our child development team have the skills and resources they need. For alcohol, it means we have the skills to recognise severe addiction and risk behaviour, and we've got the skills to address this that might be appropriate use of detox or compulsory treatment when necessary. We automatically refer all babies in Hawke's Bay to mothers who drink heavily to our child development service and we make sure those staff are trained to recognise fetal alcohol effects and to manage those. Standards means we do things properly. Our policies are evidence based our training standards are high, our interventions are effective and are supported by robust policy initiatives. And children's voices means we ask them. We seek their input when we're designing services and the feedback of child and youth clients of those services. Note that none of this 
costs anything more. This is just about using the resource we have in a more clever and effective way to make sure that the needs of children and young people are met. The United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child are extremely useful. It describes how a world should be for children. It, it gives values that we all should follow. Um, it's extremely helpful when we approach this with um, policy and designing new policy. Um, there are, there are um, hands Sorry. There are situations in our hands to choose to take them. Um, often these steps do not need more money. 